Thank you everyone for joining. So, you know, we have resumed our uh, Explore session last month after, you know, some time of break. And, you know, as we were resuming, we thought, you know what, we have a lot of really wonderful research activities going on in our province. And we have researchers and, you know, dedicated scientists working on so many interesting projects and that really relevant to our province and to our community. So this is really a chance for us to really celebrate our success and share our innovative ideas and wonderful achievements and, you know, make connection as well. So um, I'm really, really thrilled and happy to have Carla here today um, to talk to us about her works and her teams and all the things that she's been working on over so many years. So. Um, I'll do a brief introduction about Carla before I hand things over to Carla. So I'm sure a lot of you already know Carla. So Carla Feig is, is a research manager at Horizon Health Network, working with research in aging with a career spanning all sectors of health. Carla believes that uniting evidence with the practice is key to ensure the best possible care experience for individuals and their families. Carla enjoys change and has led many initiatives in both clinical and administrative roles within acute and primary healthcare systems. Her current role sees her involved in several research initiatives across Horizon involving older adults in both community and acute care settings. Carla is also a licensed physiotherapist and holds her LEAS certification through the Canadian College of Health Leaders. She recently completed her master's in of applied health services research with her qualitative study on the motivation of older adults participate in remotely delivered dementia prevention program, pro prevention study, I'm sorry. Carla holds bachelor's of physiotherapy in from uh, Queen's University and will receive her master's degree in applied health service research from the University of New Brunswick in October, which is this, this month. So. Congratulations to you, Carla. Um, and I'll hand things over to you. The floor is yours, Carla. Go ahead. Great. Thank you so much, Stella, for the warm welcome and for asking me to come and share some of what I do with the group here today. So who am I? I think this is probably the biggest question I've been asking myself a lot lately. Um, and what defines us? Is it our formal education? Is it our training and our professional skill set, our personal relationships and activities that fill our tank? And I guess I'm slowly learning that all of this defines me. It's a lens through which I view my environment and the contributions which I bring to any team, including the research team. So as my background, as you mentioned, Stella, I'm a practicing physiotherapist for 28 years and I still work privately. I've been a nurse manager of an inpatient complex continuing care unit in Ontario. I've managed hospital allied health services. I've been a community developer, the manager of primary care in Fredericton with sexual health services, a senior health consultant at the Department of Health, and now I'm wearing a research hat. So I came back from uh, to Horizon Health Network from the senior health consultant position with the department, and I had the portfolio of patient quality and safety, and I had enrolled in my master's, and you know I I just love the research, and and when I was learning more about it, and I was working with Dr. Jarrett both at the department, and she was mentioning some of these projects, and a position came open, and so that's how I transitioned back into Horizon in May of 2021. So it hasn't been that long that I've been coming back into research, um, but I have really enjoyed so far what I'm doing. So here are some of the projects and things that we're doing, and uh, some of the amazing people I work with. Probably the biggest project that I work with is the NBPOM, which is the New Brunswick Brain Health Initiative. And its overall goal is to build capacity for establishing and sustaining a platform for developing brain health supports to older adults in New Brunswick to reduce the dementia risk. And so if we look at this NBPOM, it has three main objectives. And the first one is to identify ways to engage seniors in New Brunswick who are at risk of Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. The objective two is the intervention arm, and I'll talk about three different interventions that we have been working through and some are completed. And objective three is in collaboration with NBIRDT, which is to develop the community dementia risk profiles um, so that we can target the delivery of brain health initiatives. And NBPOM is a huge team, and this are just some of the core team or the core group. 
Um, the principal investigators, Dr. Pam Jarrett and Chris McGibbon, but we have many, many other researchers from U to M, University of New Brunswick, Horizon, Vitalité. We are also affiliated with Western University and the Can Thumbs Up, the Canadian Consortium for Neurodegeneration in Aging. So just a really big team. And there's was over 20 research assistants involved in this project delivering the interventions for the Synergic, and, and they're not listed here, unfortunately. So the first thing with the NB Palm was objective one. And objective one, which was looking for ways to engage seniors in New Brunswick at risk of Alzheimer's disease and related dementia. And this was led by Bryn Robinson, who everybody knows, I think, from this team, and Linda Yetman, who is on the line. And really, you know, they did a great job of going out and linking with community, seniors living in community. They had um, stakeholder, they had roundtable meetings. The older adults actually developed the survey that was used. And all of the information can be found on the NB Palm website. And there is a, a study report as well as a toolkit to use to how to how to engage older adults in community. The objective two, so there were three specific interventions that were done. So, you know, it, it was a different HSPP project. That's Healthy Seniors Pilot Project. Most of them is like a single research project, you know, but NB Palm is just this massive thing with all of these different research components. So it made it really difficult or it still makes it difficult to do the reporting. So for objective two, the first thing was a Cognicity study and it was a French validation study. So Cognicity is an online brain health assessment and it's based out of Baycrest, which is an academic health sciences center, has a focus on brain health and aging in Toronto. This is an online assessment that anyone can go and do, and they're basically creating this big database. And our role in it was we were recruiting Francophone and Anglophone participants in New Brunswick. There was also a kind of like a sister arm in Ontario um, to do the validation. And that is still work is ongoing. I think they still need a few more participants in specific age ranges in order to have the numbers that they need for that validation. Synergic at Home, which is synchronizing exercises, remedies, and gait and cognition at home, is a feasibility study. And so it's a double blind random control tile in which participants who are at risk of dementia. So this was older adults living in community who either had two or more risk factors for developing dementia um, or they had mild cognitive impairment or subjective cognitive impairment. Um, were eligible and then they had to have a family doctor. There's there was a whole of course like any study inclusion criteria, but it was a double bland, blind random control tile. It was all delivered remotely from screening, baseline assessments, neuropsychological testing, physical assessments, including activity for activity levels, gait testing, sleep and diet surveys. It was all done through um, Zoom interface and participants had the equipment like FedEx to their home, and so all of this was done remotely. Participants were randomized to one of four intervention arms where they received 90 minutes three times a week for 16 weeks of intervention. And so if they were in the full active intervention arm, that would be 60 minutes of physical activity, which include cardio training as well as resistance training, um, and 30 minutes of cognitive training doing neuropeak. And then they repeated the, at the end of the 16 week, they repeated the testing, then they had a washout period, and then at the 10 month mark, they repeated the testing again. And so preliminary results are in. So if we look at, I have the, the kind of typical table one up there. So average age was 70. You know, we had a good representation of Francophones and Anglophones. This was delivered across the province because it was remote. It was great. We could reach a lot more people in rural communities and we probably could have had it been in person from an activity level. You know, they weren't the most active older adults, which is, you know, one of the risk factors. And actually, if you look, the, the top risk factors are listed there. On average, people had 4.6 risk factors, you know, of which sleep, being physically inactive, diet, and first degree relative to dementia are the, the most common risk factors that were shared within the population. From a feasibility perspective, we found 80% adherence, which was awesome. I mean, how many people go to the gym January 1 and then they drop out, you know, in February, the end of February, you can shoot a cannon through there and not hit anyone. Well, we had 80% adherence to the cognitive and the exercise interventions, which is amazing. We had no serious adverse events that were related to the interventions. 
and it was a really positive experience. There was a qualitative arm um, that was completed as well, and I actually did my master's on some of the motivational aspects, and participants really enjoyed it. They developed an amazing rapport with the research um, intervention staff, and, and they felt better overall. We do have, we will have some more publications and some more things coming out of um, Synergic, but for now I did have the link. It is, um, the protocol is published if anyone wants to have a look at that. Another thing that's ongoing right now, another intervention is the Brain Health Support Program. And this is a Canadian made educational program that delivers online learning modules to older adults. And we are one of the seven research teams that are participating. And we have about 65 individuals that went through consent and 60 completed baseline. And then we, we are in the process. So they do modules and then they have intervention or follow-up at three, six, nine, and 12. Most of our participants are in the 12 month phase of assessments where they do go through a fairly um, onerous online uh, cognitive assessment. Um, and we will have some results hopefully in the new year from that. And objective three, which I talked about, is kind of that risk profiling for communities. And so this is led by Sandra Regalis at NBIRDT, and she's been able to pull community level data from Stats Canada and really put together these community risk profiles. I didn't put any of her maps up because I wasn't sure where we're at in the ability to reach that information publicly, but she, she can look at things and, and compare communities. You know, what did they look like in 2015 compared to a few years later for levels of physical inactivity or um, alcohol intake or management of hypertension or diabetes? You know, so we can really get a good picture at a community level, and that will help really with. Um, targeted interventions through government funding and also through healthcare. You know, we should probably really reach out and target these communities that have the greatest potential to either slow um, the impact of dementia or delay the onset of it. And my role in NBPOM, well, I think it's a bit of a mixed bag really i sit on the executive committee we have weekly operational committees i'm involved in adverse events reporting and tracking for synergic at home i organize the data safety and monitoring committee for synergic at home i actually oversee the full brain health support study um, and so the, the staffing and operationalization of that i'm involved in the knowledge translation and uh, in may linda moved over to a different project and so um, I then supervise the remaining Horizon Health Network staff that are involved in the project. I presented this project and aspects of it at a national CADETH conference. We've been to the Health Research Foundation, uh, Health Research Week for the last couple of years. And as I was talking to Stella earlier, we're going to Toronto to present in as well. We have um, a poster that's been accepted at the Gerontological Society of America for presentation in, in November. Fresh Care, so switching hats, Fresh Care, uh, I'm actually a co-investigator on this project. And this was looking at frailty focused enhancements to seniors hospital care project. And this looked at delivering specialized education and frailty training based on the five M's of geriatric medicine to frontline staff. And we had embedded research assistance for 18 weeks of data collection. So we had staff going and doing pre-tests, and then following during the intervention phase and then post-intervention. So this was, you know, you had double participants. You had patient participants because we were collecting patient level data. So we were looking at things such as um, uh, pro potentially inappropriate medications, rate of falls, delirium, clinical frailty scale on the patient. And then we actually had the staff participants. We're looking at their education knowledge and if anything changed with the intervention. And then we're looking to see, did any of that carry over into patient related outcomes based upon the training? And we had 64 acute care staff and 99 patients who were participants in this uh, project. And as I said, my role was really co-investigator, weekly meetings, data review, some KT direction. And this was led, Dr. Feltmate is the principal investigator. It was led by Jennifer, is still being led by Jennifer Peterson. Um, and sometimes in that many research assistants at that many sites and all the data and stuff, really my role was to be that, you know, 
hundred or thousand mile view to kind of be back a little bit overseeing from a larger as to kind of where we're going next with this and and uh, help problem solve at that level. Dimension navigation. So this is a project led out of UNB and what we did is we put patient navigator program in place in New Brunswick. We embedded patient navigators at primary health care clinics within Horizon and Vitalite. Um, and we ran for 12 months. So we provided services for people living with dementia in the community, their care partners, and also the healthcare providers that were helping to navigate the system. We had 156 participants. There was a patient and family advisory committee with input and co-design of the program. And, uh, you know, data is just coming out of that now. We have most of the data completed. However, the qualitative interviews are still ongoing with the participants. My role really was to liaise with community health centers, so we had them identify who could be a, a potential navigator for their community. And then, of course, all the hiring and navigating the system for those navigators because they became Horizon staff for that one year period of time. CHARM, coordinating transitions from hospitals for older adults with fractures, interventional mixed methods study. This is ongoing and it's led by Natasha Hansen um, in collaboration with uh, Trauma in New Brunswick. And this is looking at the effects of having support from patient navigators. So these patient navigators are actually embedded in the orthopedic unit at St. John uh, Regional Hospital. And so they're looking at evaluating the difference of a patient navigator makes with receiving standard of care versus having a navigator help facilitate those transitions. And so looking at things like it, um, length of stay, healthcare utilization, post-discharge, patient family experience and satisfaction. And so those, uh, we just stopped active recruitment at the end of September, so we don't have any results yet to share. There's quite a few things going on with regards to hip, hip fracture research. Um, for the first one, we did a white paper just looking at, um, it was a descriptive epidemiological study, retrospective looking at everyone who had a hip fracture over the age of 65 admitted to hospital, and a bunch of outcomes were looked at it. For time's sake, I won't get into it, but a white paper was written and shared with the Provincial Trauma Advisory Committee. And then the other one, which is the health outcomes of older adults after hospitalization for a hip fracture, we just specifically looked at ones that were admitted um, to the St. John Regional Hospital. We looked at a subset of data and really trying to figure out what are some of those, you know, not just what are the descriptive statistics, like what does this population look like, but we looked at with logistic regression to determine what variables are associated with increased acute care length of stay, 30 day mortality post discharge, one more one year mortality post discharge. So, you know, does age, sex, time to surgery, diagnosis of dementia, residence prior to admission, discharge destination, like how does all that information feed together and what is the picture that it presents? And then so how do we use that to move back and, and maybe view some of these individuals with a different lens um, when we're working with in the acute care setting? This is a recent publication that we've had, and it was uh, just in September, and it was looking at the pictorial fit frail scale. And so again, we looked at data retrospectively in the electronic health record. Is there enough data in there already for us to determine frailty levels? Because we know that frailty impacts outcomes. Um, and so that was just published. I encourage you to look it up if you're interested. So what is my role? Keeping the wheels on the bus. I think that's what I, strive to do every day. Horizon Health Network operations can be overwhelming. You know, I was a manager in community health centers, so I know the policies, the practices, and most importantly, the people. I think my recommendations are foster relationships, learn from others, and never hesitate to reach out and ask. You know, you've got all the human resource management things to do. Then there's the Service New Brunswick, equipment procurement and access, and then, of course, the budgeting and reporting are just key functions that I do within all of these different initiatives. Human resources, it's never ending. You know, we'll just put a few of those numbers up there so that you can see. When I have the plus one, it means that that is an employee in that position, but they may actually report through to UNB. So, for example, with NV Palm, we had staff in Vitalite, in Horizon, um, at UNB and I think at UDM as well. So it can be very complex as to who you look after, but overall, everyone has to work together at the same way. And with any contracted staff, 
they flow in and out of those positions. It's never static. Onboarding of staff can be overwhelming and it takes a lot of time. So my advice is know your collective agreements and what is allowed. Reach out to your human resource advisor if you're not sure. Put in the pay band exemption. If the offer letter comes back lower than what you think the individual should be having based on their experience. And just remember, Horizon's a healthcare organization. So what they might use to classify someone might not line up with the research world. And so, you know, it's okay to challenge. It's okay to ask because we don't really fit into that normal healthcare operation model. So the, so what now at phase of knowledge transition? You know, what are we doing with all of this amazing data? And if you think about it, you know, public funding for these projects means public access to results. You know, having research sit on a shelf is not good enough, and we really need to develop and leverage the relationships to keep the research moving into practice. You know, we have, it's easy, I think, for us to do the scientific or academic, you know, those publications, the conferences, things like that. But how do we really get this into practice? What is the end user lens on the results and not just the academic lens? How does this change the experience of the older adult as they interact with the system? You know, find the common ground with the healthcare provider and with the organization. You know, you have to make it easy for the frontline to do the right thing. And we have to have that top down, so policy or approach or guidelines to practice and bottom up. And one thing, you know, a practical example of that is within Fresh, there is um, there are or order sets that are already in existence to be used with some of these populations, but the frontline staff, the nursing staff didn't know about them. So, you know, you can have the data there, but if it's not in a way that's easy accessible or they know about it and it's not going to be used and put in practice, then, you know, you don't have that bottom up approach that you need for it. You know, appreciative inquiry for implementation is always a good strategy. What are the positive We're finding those groups or those units maybe that do a better job and saying how do they do the right thing and how do we, you know, mimic that in other units or have it spread and scale that way. And it's all really about relationship. Don't forget about the capacity building. So when we're working in research, we have all of these people and these research grants produce funding opportunities for employment. You know, we've had people from our project in the HSPP projects go to work at MBI or DT, MEC2, public health, research services, a research unit in Alberta. You know, so it's not just about doing the research and getting the results. It's about building system capacity within research and within evidence. There's, there's all the collaborations. You know, you might be working on one little thing, but that builds a partnership with some of these research people that will be useful in future years. So it's always that system collaboration and working collaboratively with lots of different um, groups or universities and, and, you know, private and public partnerships as well. But don't also forget about the local level care, right? Local research has the ability to guide and form best practice, leading to better patient outcomes. And participants, they feel the direct benefit sometimes of this research. So individuals participating can benefit directly from it as well. My challenge is how do we move forward within Horizon to become a true learning health system? How do we systematically gather the, and create the evidence and apply the most promising evidence to improve care? And that is really so what, now what? That's I think what we all should be striving to do. So thank you for uh, letting me share this with you.